Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chabarim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cool Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheists United Studios. Hey, Joey. Humans have been speaking for longer than we've been humans. Much longer, in fact. According to a paper published a few years ago in the journal Science Advances, the necessary equipment for speech, the throat shape and motor skills, reach back 27 million years when humans and old world monkeys like baboons and mandrills shared a common ancestor. What makes this so remarkable is that anatomically modern humans have only been around for about 200,000 years. We rely on speech, to form connections, express ideas and feelings, influence decisions, and motivate change. Yet just because talking is encoded in our DNA doesn't mean everyone's good at it. We're delighted to chat with Saba Rabar, a public speaking coach, communication strategist, and founder of Speak With Confidence. Before that, she was a celebrity gossip blogger and editor-in-chief at Socialite Life, managed content and social media for the food website Cooking Panda, and was a digital platform manager for entertainment clients, including DC Comics, IMDb Pro, HBO Max, and Warner Brothers Video Games. Saba, welcome to Amusing Jews. Hello, so excited to be here. I sound really impressive when you put all of the things that I've done together. I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna start just introducing myself as, hi, yes, yeah, Saba, gossip blogger, platform manager. Or you can just show them the clip of our show. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So yeah, looking back at your gossip articles, you had a very conversational style. Gossip readers expect alliteration, puns, humor, colorful metaphors, slang, and so on. Did that sort of writing help hone your communication skills? Yeah, definitely. I really took pride in the fact that whenever people read anything that I wrote, they always would say, oh, I can hear your voice as I'm reading this. And I think what's really cool especially in what I was doing, which was, you know, it wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't a fancy journalism. It was more of a like, oh, hey, look at how hot Orlando Bloom looks today. So it was all about doing things that were like fun and engaging and zingy. And there's a term for it in like the public speaking world, which is called laser speak, which is really just honing in on what it is that you want to say in as few words as possible. And so that was a huge part of what I was doing because people aren't coming to read like 10 paragraphs of, I don't know, me explaining what the British royals are doing. No, they're coming to read like four sentences of me being funny and quippy and then clicking through some photos. So that really helped figure out how exactly to get things going as quickly as possible be entertaining, be engaging. I mean, it's all the things that you find in journalism. That's that is how you should be communicating. Like, just get to the point of what it is that you want to say. She says after having rambled for a couple of seconds here. But that is that's kind of the the main way that I have gone about a lot all the different like writing and communicating that I have done that I've been lucky enough to do, which has been super fun. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, being from your background and sort of having your family in the Persian community and then communicating with the largely non-Persian audience, obviously, does that also help to kind of like be able to phrase things in a way that uh, would speak to different audiences, maybe at different times of the day and that kind of thing, kind of getting accustomed to that, uh, that ability to communicate? It always kind of feels like, you know, you're the terms like code switching, like you're going back and forth between like, this is how I would be talking if I was, you know, with my Iranian grandmother. This is how I would be if I was with my like male executive CEO. And so you're constantly switching through like, what's the best way to get my point across to this specific person? And so I definitely think that that helps having done that my entire life of going back and forth between like Iranian Jewish girl with my family and then you know, Iranian Jewish girl out in the world. Like I, I generally present the same, but there are going to be ways that are much more effective commun to communicate with this person as opposed to that person. So, you know, it's something that I, I never really thought about, but definitely makes a lot of sense <laughs> why I have chosen these, these careers in this way too. You also talked about being born with a microphone in your mouth. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 
came out. Well, I, the first thing I did, I literally came out eyes wide open. My mom was like, why isn't she crying? Is she okay? And it was just because I was staring at the world. And my mom was like, that's kind of always how you've been. Just super curious, super inquisitive. I started babbling really quickly. I started talking at nine months. And by like a year, I was forming sentences. And then that has just never stopped. I like to talk. I love talking to people. I'm the type of person who, if the telemarketer calls and I have time, like I'll talk to them. It's just an enjoyable time. I'll ask them what restaurants they like, wherever they live. Like those, I just enjoy that sort of thing. So I, uh, my family has never been able to shut me up and they know something's wrong if I'm not talking, which is also kind of rude because some days maybe I just don't want to talk and I'm fine. But instead, all I get is, are you okay? You've been very quiet today. And I'm like, no, I'm fine. So anthropologists observe that as social creatures, we evolved and continue to live in environments where it's in our interest to pay attention to those who we perceive to be at the top. So I think celebrity fascination um, is probably an outgrowth of this natural tendency. Do you have a theory as to why people gravitate towards celebrities and celebrity gossip? Yeah, not only do I have a theory, but in my mind many moons ago, I was like, I'm going to go get my PhD in media studies and I'm going to write a paper on this. So I've, well, we'll see how far I can get with all of that. But yeah, the what I've always said is people love to gossip. We love to gossip about anybody and everybody. I like to gossip with my friends, about my friends, about my family, about like my friend's friend who I have a passing like Instagram photo I've seen of them. And it's I'm not unique in this way. People love to do this. It's a thing that has been happening for, you know, however long humans have been alive, like gossip has been happening. And so looking at celebrities, they're basically our communal gossip. They're the people who everybody knows. That's the, the main reason that all of this took off. And I think people forget about that because they think, oh, God, who cares about this celebrity? Why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because that's how we are built to talk about this. And it just so happens that, you know, everybody knows who Brad Pitt is or like a George Clooney is. These are people. These are like archetypes throughout history that are always going to be like, you know, the top of the social ladder of the human ladder. And they're just who we all look to. And I think it's just a very natural progression of you talk about people that everybody knows. And who does everybody know? Celebrity. So it makes total sense that celebrity gossip has kind of taken off in the way that it has and continues to take off. And, you know, I don't write about it anymore, but I still read my celebrity gossip blogs every day and I listen to my celebrity podcast where they talk about people who I have never even heard of kind of a thing and it's it's still fun it's like it's a communal activity and you do it with humans who everybody in the community knows so I love a gossip nothing wrong with it if you want to gossip I'm here if you want to gossip about celebrities or about like my neighbor who's annoying I will any and all of it I really run the spectrum <laughs> Well, it seems like you have a good attitude and sense of humor about it, and you maybe don't take it as seriously as some people do. But I'm sure when you were when you were in that world, there were some people who got really obsessive and perhaps uh, confrontational and that sort of thing. I did get my share of death threats if I wrote about you know somebody that people didn't like. If you Google my name, I'm sure some of those things still pop up where people were like. They better be careful. We're going to find out where she lives. And I was like, I literally just said that this person was boring. Calm down. Like, this is not a big deal. But yeah, I obviously I have my fandoms and the people that I love and care about. But I do think, you know, human beings, as we tend to do with everything, we take it to extremes in a way that is not good. But you can also just have fun with it, which I like to do. And I think the majority of the world likes to do. You know, we all love reading the tabloid headlines while we're in the grocery store aisle, you know, like those are just fun things to look at. 
and you don't have to be as uh, insane with it, which is so rude. But also, I've you know I've seen the dark side of the internet. <laughs> yeah, well, every light side has a dark side. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Maybe on a lighter side of the same topic, you've done a lot of social media content and management. As a professional communicator, do you have a bag of tricks or maybe a list of do's and don'ts in terms of how to best attract eyeballs? Yeah, I yes and yes and no. Like there are definitely sort of best practices across the board. Social doesn't make any sense. Something that works on Monday will stop working on Tuesday and then start working again on Wednesday because you are just beholden to algorithms and audiences and how like a certain person is feeling that day and you know how Instagram chooses to show your content on any given day of the week. So it really is like throwing everything you can at a wall and just seeing what sticks and doing that for as long as it continues working. So like whenever we put together a social strategy for anybody and I, you know, I still do this, I just kind of laugh because I'm like, yeah, sure, we could put together a strategy. But at the end of the day, we're just going to end up seeing what works. But like, you know, looking at the the do's and the don'ts and the best practices, there are definitely things that do work better. So you know, some some hot tips for you guys. Uh, stuff that, you know, po- you post on Instagram isn't necessarily going to work on Facebook. So you constantly want to be making sure that you are figuring out what your audience likes per platform. I always called it like bespoke content. And across all of your platforms, you want to make sure that you are authentic, that you are being engaging, you're being interesting, and you're having fun with it. I think so many brands, especially you know, pre-2019, I want to say, is when things kind of start to go off the rails social-wise. It just got, like, so serious and intense, and it just, it wasn't as fun anymore. And so kind of bringing that fun back into your social platforms is really important. And especially with the way that TikTok has kind of come in and disrupted everything, I don't necessarily consider TikTok a social platform. I think it's, like, a content creation. I think it's much more in line with, like, a YouTube than anything else but because it's done so well the social platforms are now trying to replicate it and in that way it kind of you know has entered the conversation there but again what made tiktok cool being fun being authentic being engaging in that way and so yeah you it's all about figuring out what works per platform and again what works on monday might not work on tuesday i've had stuff where you know we've looked at every best practice we've seen what other people are doing out there we look at numbers we're like okay if people are posting like this that means they should be getting this sort of engagement we've done exactly that and then turned back around and said that actually didn't work going back to our previous thing where we were doing the opposite of, of you know whatever other brands are doing is working for us so it's it's a game it's a really fun very silly game but i think everybody should just just have more fun with social don't take it so seriously again as we were saying with the gossip it's just it's a place it's social media it's a place for you to like engage with other people which i think is so important and fun and more people should be (laughs) not so serious about it it sounds like a game where no one knows the rules and the rules always change that is 100% correct. Yeah. Anytime we would post on Facebook, we would get this amount of clicks. For like years, it was working. It was working. And then just one day, like Facebook changes the algorithm. And it's like, oh, you mean the thing that we've built our entire business on isn't working anymore? Cool. Cool, 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 cool. That's why two of my previous companies don't exist anymore because they went a little, a little too all in on stuff that was constantly changing. So you also did some voice acting on the cartoon series Mixed Nuts, which aired on PBS and centers on a group of friends from different backgrounds, Iranian, Indian, Austrian, Cuban, and Korean, sort of an international peanuts, I've heard it described. Could you tell us about that show and maybe your role in it? Yeah, so I was lucky enough to be part of this purely based on nepotism. I'm not going to lie. It was very exciting. I was super lucky because my uncle-in-law, my aunt's husband, created a cartoon. This was 2005. It was called Bob and Friends, a first Nooruz. And so my uncle is, 
you know, he's a, a hodgepodge of things. He's half American Christian, half Iranian Muslim, and he converted to Judaism when he married my aunt. So, you know, he is all the things. And growing up for him, he always kind of talked about how, you know, he had a lot of trouble reconciling being Iranian with being super American because, like, you know, his dad is from the Midwest and his mom was like a loud, loud Persian lady. So, like, how do you kind of figure all these things out? And so Bobak and Friends was about the Persian New Year, was about this little boy named Bobak understanding his Persian roots for the first time. And so his cousins from Iran come to visit. And I played one of the cousins, Susan. She was a bratty little girl, which was super fun for me. And, you know, it was about kind of accepting that part of you, that Iranian heritage that he hadn't really gotten to appreciate, which, you know, being a being an Iranian Jewish kid growing up in a, a predominantly american community when i was younger that was really fun to kind of see myself in a way and so mix nuts came along and it took that idea and expanded on it so you had kids from like you were saying international peanuts um from all over and i continued to play susan and it was really fun because we got to do these kind of crazy things and just show that, you know, a kid from Korea is kind of the same as a kid born in who, you know, who is white, basically. Like they have a lot of things in common and it's it was really fun. And my favorite episode was one kind of centered around trying new things. And there was a song that was written for it. Uh it was called you'll tr if you try it then you'll like it and they were basically like here's persian food here's korean food here's indian food here's this here's that and that was kind of like the thesis of the whole show is just you have to be open to all these other cultures so yeah if you can find mixed nuts somewhere find it watch it if you can't find mixed nuts or even if you do also watch Bobak and friends the first no ruse the persian new year is my favorite of the three new years that i get to celebrate so it's definitely really fun and you'll get to hear me as well as my brother, my dad, my grandfather, my brother's best friend. Those might be all the all the family members of Britain that are in it, but we're all there. We're all there. So the fear of public speaking is arguably the most common phobia ahead of death, spiders and heights. The National Institute of Mental Health reports that public speaking anxiety or glossophobia affects about 40 percent of people. In your view, what makes public speaking so scary? It's definitely that feeling of being exposed and feeling judged. So like when you're in a group or you're walking somewhere and suddenly your entire body like feels tingly and you feel exposed in a way and you just feel so gross and icky, public speaking and the, the fear of it really comes from that. It's just this anxiety and this fear of oh no i am exposing myself to all of these people who are going to be sitting there and watching me and judging me and it's not good and i definitely understand why it scares people and i think a lot of times people have to remember that you know everybody who is watching you wants you to succeed so do you have any uh public speaking coaching philosophy you want to share with us yeah, I think take that anxiety and use it. Use it to your advantage. You know, whenever I work with clients and even just my friends who have come to me for advice, I just try to create a space that feels safe and comfortable for them because I want them to be able to develop whatever their unique style is in a way that feels comfortable. Because once you feel comfortable in yourself and in your abilities as a speaker, even if it's just when you're doing it by yourself, as soon as you go out into the world to start speaking, like you are so much better prepared than you were before. I did stage management for a number of years as well. Obviously, I'm a theater kid in case you can't tell. So I would always use the like insane stress and anxiety to do a good job as a stage manager. And it was always in the moments where I was like, I don't need to be stressed. I am good that I would mess up. 
And so I don't think people need to be like scared of the anxiety that they're feeling. I think they've got to take it and use it because ultimately that's a strength, you know, oh, overcoming whatever fear it is that you have. That is going to make you a much better speaker. And it's all about figuring out what your strengths are and then what makes you unique as a speaker as well. And so I really love working with people and figuring out what it is that, you know, makes this work for them because it's it's all about feeling comfortable in your own skin to then go up and feel comfortable in front of a large group of people, a small group of people. It doesn't matter. There's always going to be stress. You know, I who do this semi-professionally, I guess you could say. I talk in front of a lot of people a lot as much as I can. Even I get stressed. Celebrities talk all the time about how they have, you know, stage fright and fears. And it's totally normal, but it's not letting that stop you from doing the things that you should be doing and using it to your advantage. And I have felt that for a while. And I like being able to put that out into the world. So... On that front, what's the best way for our listeners to find out more about your coaching services? You can go to my website, sabarabar.com, S-A-B-B-A-R-A-H-B-A-R.com. Shockingly, that domain name was not taken. But yeah, from there, you can send me an email. You can schedule something with me right on the website. I offer like a 30-minute consultation. We can figure out if this is even a good idea, if you really want to do this, if we vibe. Or we can just like talk about nothing. Again, I don't know if you guys have picked this up. I like talking. I have a lot of things to say about a variety of things. And so I'm happy to just chat with you if that makes you feel better. <laughs> we can figure that out. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Saba. Thank you. This has been so cool. And to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe.